In the name of the one God and Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So at this time of year in our lectionary, uh, our, whoever decided on the lectionary many years ago, uh, and this is shared by a vast number of churches, uh, decided to, to include just a few weeks of the story of Job. And so we have uh, the beginning of that today. And I always, uh, I always smile when I hear the beginning, as Klaus read. Uh, there once was a man in the name of Uz, whose name was Job. And it's such a nice uh, beginning. And then we get into all kinds of uh, shenanigans and Satan and the, the angels and all kinds of things. Uh, but, uh, and we will, we will be unpacking parts of Job in just the next few weeks. Likewise, our lectionary uh, dips a little bit into the book of Hebrews. Uh, and uh, I want to talk about Hebrews today and also a bit about the gospel. And it's a little bit unfortunate, quite unfortunate, that we don't hear more of Job uh, in our lectionary, although having read Job, and many of you I'm sure have as well, there are long, long pages of, uh, uh, of lamentations, and there's long pages of argument, uh, and then there's wonderful uh, long pages of dialogue between God and Job, but it is, it is a wonderful book, and I remember uh, some years ago, uh, there was uh, a little bit of a buzz where uh, some other folks uh, translated Job, uh, and as you know, Job suffers uh, mightily, uh, and uh, there was a, a Buddhist uh, scholar named Stephen Mitchell who translated Job, uh, and sort of interpreted uh, Job through a Buddhist lens, which was uh, an interesting uh, take on Job. And Hebrews, too, is one in which we only get, of course, a little, uh, a little smattering over the next few weeks. But uh, Hebrews, as, uh, as you may know and you may not know, uh, is a book located uh, pretty near the end of our New Testament. And one of the things that uh, I learned at some point is uh, and you, I've always wondered, you know, how do we get the, all of those letters in the particular order in which we find them in the Bible? Well, uh, the longer letters are coming right after the Gospels, and the shorter letters, uh, the shorter epistles, uh, tend toward the, the end uh, of, our, uh, of our scriptures. And with Hebrews, it is, a, it is a rather short uh, book uh, compared to many. Uh, just looking in a Bible, it's about 11 sides of pages, you know, in, in, in our common uh, thought. Probably in an hour or so, or even less, uh, we could read it. And a few things about Hebrews. Um, it is a, among the more sophisticated uh, pieces of writing in the New Testament. Long thought to have been written by Paul, although most scholars, the predominant view now, are not written by Paul, and then there were other ideas about other main apostles or uh, other companions of Paul, but most agree it is anonymous. Uh, and it uses, the writer uses a broad vocabulary and uses uh, a, a, a wide variety of contemporary rhetorical and, and oratory devices, uh, things we learned maybe in our ninth grade English class, alliteration, uh, 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 parallelism, uh, balancing uh, things, metaphor, uh, just all kinds of wonderful pieces, some of which uh, we can't appreciate in the English because, of course, uh, the alliteration would have been uh, in Hebrew uh, or in, uh, in Greek, depending on, uh, on how you might understand that. But also the author used, as you might uh, note from you know, sermons or letters to the editor today, a 
wide variety of examples, probably pointing out that uh, his or her listeners uh, were uh, diverse in their understandings and were perhaps cosmopolitan on some level. Uh, a few are education, agriculture, uh, seafaring, athletics, and the arts, uh, some important uh, categories. And just in, in these short chapters, 16 or so, I believe, chapters of Hebrews, uh, a wide variety of these uh, examples. And some have said uh, that it is a, not so much a letter as an extended sermon. But of course, one is, it is important to remember that these sermons, whether they were letters or sermons, were carried to communities uh, and uh, read to them. So wherever the author might have been uh, writing uh, the letter or the sermon, uh, it was then proclaimed, uh, in a sense, or told, uh, given uh, to that community. Uh, and this tradition was very strong in the early church and actually continued uh, long after the Middle Ages into even later than that when oftentimes uh, priests and even bishops weren't always very well educated at all uh, and were local and could barely, well, they could read. They could read uh, what was sent, but uh, they weren't scholars uh, in any sense. And so in the, in the letter or in the sermon itself, uh, it calls itself a word of exhortation. And the texts uh, come from all portions, all, all uh, portions of the Old Testament come into play. Uh, the Pentateuch, the first few books of, of the Old Testament, the prophets, the Psalms, and others as well. And so, uh, I was always curious about this name, the, what is this, uh, what is this letter? Uh, well, the letter to the Hebrews, it's a strange uh, sense, but the audience is probably people of a Jewish background, uh, but with uh, this deep Christian commitment. And I love today, uh, this seems to happen more and more, and I know that Jonathan does a lot of work to choose our hymns. But the fact that we say, uh, ode to joy, uh, in a sense, Hebrews is a kind of an ode to joy, the joy of this deep connection with Jesus, and that Jesus has done it all, so that we, all we need to do is, in a sense, to graft ourselves onto uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus' wagon, so to speak. We just need to get on uh, the bus, so to speak and uh, follow Jesus. And then, uh, when this was written, and even today, there are uh, many thoughts about what one needs to do, the list of things one needs to accomplish, um, whether we need to pray five times a day, or one time a day, one time a week, uh, we can debate all of those things. But here is this, uh, this notion that we are directly connected to the joy of God through Christ. And so that is such a, a wonderful hymn. And then we just sang uh, Blessed Assurance. And also Hebrews, uh, and we'll talk about Hebrews in the next few weeks, but we will, we will see that Hebrews gives uh, uh, an assurance and, and a kind of uh, reminder uh, that all that's needed uh, is to turn to Christ. And there's a lot in Hebrews where the author speaks uh, in terms of the Jewish temple and, and of the sacrifices that the priest, the priest takes on uh, the suffering of the community and offers sacrifice on behalf of the community and uses that as a, as a kind of repeated metaphor or example of Christ, where Christ is uh, is this priest, uh, in a sense, who brings the sacrifice uh, to God. And then we, uh, later in the book, we hear of my favorite character, not really, but one of my favorite characters of the Bible, uh, Melchizedek, uh, is such an interesting uh, name and an interesting notion that Jesus is a, is a priest 
according to this order of this strange fellow that Abraham met, uh, who was a priest of the one true God. And we don't know a lot about it. It's sort of like a, a character out of the Lord of the Rings or something that just comes in and, and leaves and only makes a couple of appearances. Uh, and uh, I find that mysterious and also wonderful. But that Christ is a priest, not according to the, you know, the, 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 the offices of the, of the particular church or the politics of, of the synagogue or, or of uh, all of those regulations, but Jesus himself, of course, being the Son of God, is a different sort of priest. And if he's alive with anything, he's alive with this strange uh, Melchizedek. And so in Hebrews, uh, if you were to sit down and read it, which I recommend, I have the, the Bible, the entire Bible on audio, so I can, uh, I actually just listened to all of Hebrews. Uh, I had about an hour drive to do the other day, and in just about an hour I heard a, a very, a very wonderful British gentleman read to me Hebrews on my iPhone. Uh, so that was uh, quite wonderful, really. It's a quite wonderful book that doesn't necessarily get thought of or talked about that much. Uh, but uh, through uh, Christ, Christians have this direct access to God. It's this wonderful notion, which of course we were reminded of in the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation. We don't need all of uh, these intermediaries between us and Christ. And we can follow Christ's example. Uh, we can step, step into the path of Christ confident, confident in, a, in this covenantal relationship with God. And of course, in the letter, we hear a lot of uh, comparisons to the covenants of the Old Testament. Uh, but here we have this confidence. Uh, and because we have this confidence that we are... Uh, living in that blessed assurance, as the hymn says, that we can follow in Christ's example. And ultimately, all of this rhetoric and all of these uh, metaphors and all of these wonderful uh, rhetorical devices and, and, and beautiful language is really because this is a reflection on the one the one through whom God has definitively spoken, Jesus Christ. And to that is uh, just a wonderful example for all of us. And so I fully recommend Hebrews if you have an hour uh, to spare, or even just dip in and out, or when you come to church, we'll uh, be reading parts of it the next few weeks. But it is a wonderful gift to us and a reminder of our direct access that we have to the one loving God.